Hello and welcome to the Motor Week review of 2001. Throughout the year, the team and I have driven hundreds of cars with a huge range of price, power and performance. But today, we're going to show you our top four cars of the year. The cars that have done something really special for us. I know they're not all Porsches, Ferraris or Lamborghinis. We've taken into account everyday use, price and practicality. Well, almost. Yeah, almost, Brendan, because of all the fantastic cars that we've driven this year, for me, they don't get much better, or I guess are much more impractical, than the stunning Renault Clio V6. And I waited all year for it, but when it came, it didn't disappoint. The Mini 1, my car of 2001. This has been such a tough decision, but for me, for its sheer grin factor, the Mitsubishi Evo 6 is my chariot of 2001. And there's a little controversy with my choice too. This car was introduced last year, the BMW X5, but I've chosen the latest engine, the three litre diesel. Now the styling of most 4x4s, with the possible exception of the Range Rover, look like they've been designed by a 6 former with a Meccano set, but not the X5. Look at it, it's absolutely stunning. All industrial curves and lines. It's the Guggenheim on wheels. Now, I don't normally like aggressive looks on a car, but this is beautifully styled aggression. The only criticisms I've got of the looks are at the back end, it's not very pretty. And why the diesel can't have the very sporty twin, twin exhaust pipe that the 4.4 litre has, I don't know. And styling has triumphed over practicality here in the boot. If the roof line was extended to the very back of the car, it would give you a whole load more versatility in terms of load carrying. But that's all nitpicking. Concentrate on the front and that 5 Series steroid fueled grille. So from the biggest and most practical of the four to easily the most insane. Insane? Of course it is, but that's why it's my car of 2001. There's no computer design bland wind tunnel clone here. For me, this is without doubt the most unique looking car on the road. So unique that I've only ever seen two others driving about in this country. Squint hard and you can see the Clio's roots underneath, that awesome body kit. There's more mesh grill than you could shake a stick at. It's wider than your mother-in-law's hips, sits lower than a Scotsman at a charity dinner and those wheels are perfection. No gaping gaps underneath the arches, very nice. And the twin exhausts are the finishing touch to one of the ultimate bad boy cars. This car doesn't turn heads, it rips them off at a thousand yards. Maybe I should change my coffee. But if the Clio V6 is a little too much in your face, then what about a nice curvy Mini? Want to know why I'm smiling? Because this Mini is smiling at me and it's infectious. In the few days that I've been driving it, you go by people and they look up and they smile. I've even come back to the car a couple of times to find people just standing admiring it. You can't help but like it. I've walked around it numerous times and I still can't find an angle that I dislike. But my favourite angle has to be head-on with the slatted grille, the lovely oval headlights and the clam-shaped bonnet. I also love the fact that the cleverly disguised pillars at the side and back of the car give the impression of one window going all the way round. It's so lovable, round and cute, yet its wide stance is really defined by the steeply raked side and flared wheel arches. You know, it looks like it means business too. And last but not least, another Larry Boy racer car, the Evo 6. Rich, aren't you and Rob getting on a bit for cars like that? Think I smelled it, Hammond? No, not at all. But then this is a bit of a boy's toy. It certainly isn't pretty compared to the other three, not by a long way. But then being pretty is not what the Mitsubishi Evo 6 is about, which is just as well. But it does have presence. This is not a vehicle you can ignore from any angle. On just one car, there are more scoops, spoilers and skirts than an Essex car park. Paint one of these matte black and I think you'd have something resembling a stealth car. It all means business. The huge air dam at the front, the great dinner plate fog lamps. You want to be careful about parking near the coast and leaving those things on or you'll have shipwrecks on your conscience. They're all the result of development work on the rally car and they probably actually do stuff to help the car's performance, which is particularly important when you're going ridiculously fast, which you will be, vicar. So a veritable potpourri of vehicles there, but what other cars scored well in the looks department this year? Ooh. Glenda. Uh, well, I'm a bit of a girl when it comes to looks. I like sort of curvy, round, cute-like cars. Like, you know, like the smart car, the Audi TT, the A3, the Golf. I don't like ostentatious, loud cars, and I'd feel embarrassed to get into this. It's not designed to look 
pretty. It's designed to go really fast. If you want looks, I could have gone for the Maserati Spider. Because oh, that looks stunning and it's got that Ferrari V8 engine, or Ferrari inspired, which is fantastic. Or, still with performance and looks, the TVR Tuscan. I mean, that's good looking. Ostentatious there. Starred opposite, um, um, what's his Travolta. name? Travolta, Travolta. Travolta in that film. That's good looking. Mm. Rob? I like that. Uh, well, being the young boy racer that I am, I'm, <laughs> right. I'm not that old. I do like my bits of plastic stuck on the car, so the MG Z range, <laughs> right up my street. Yeah. And nice the big spoiled Alphas, the 156, picnic table on the back. Yeah, right. my sort of thing, but just to show I have got a little bit of class, Jaguar XJR, that would be right up in my nice. lottery winner's fantasy oh, garage. Nice. You have to be a lottery winner, but I am with you on the Jaguar front. The new baby Jag, the X-Type is every inch of Jaguar, but sadly there aren't that many inches of it. Nice. Yes, exactly. And I like the chunkiness of the Peugeot 307, the new European car of the year, even though it's a bit confused as to what okay. it wants to be. Going with the crown there. Yeah. So that's enough about the outside of these things. What about the inside? Now, just before I talk about the inside of the Clio, I just want to silence all those of you at home that think it's not practical. My luggage for a week. My luggage space. Like a glove. What's the problem? So all right, there is a tiny bit of luggage space under the bonnet, the engine's in the back, remember, but apart from that, this thing is completely impractical. It is an engine on wheels with a little bit of space for you and one passenger. But if you're Billy No Mates like me, you don't need passengers, and I'd rather have a V6 for company anyway. Now, the interior of the Clio V6 is its worst feature. I know it's based on a Clio, but for 26 grand, I want a little bit more than racing seats, a splash of Alcantara on the doors there, and a little bit of aluminium trim. What about some TVR Tuscan style or Audi TT class? It all feels solid enough, it's well put together, but it's just not different enough than the now old model regular Clio. Now, normally when I get into a car of this class, the interior is either boring, Germanic and dull, such as the VW Polo, or it tries to be different and ends up being gaudy and cheap, like the Alfa Romeo 154. But, the Mini breaks the mould and it dares to be different and gets away with it looking really rather cool. I mean, when I first got into this car, I thought maybe it's a bit too busy, a bit too noisy, but you look a little bit closer and the build quality and the finish are absolutely superb. And the design isn't tacky, but actually really retro and rather funky. I mean, look at this switch gear. It is absolutely funky chunky and it isn't about to drop off in your hand. Now, my favourite features have to be this centrally mounted speedometer and this massive steering wheel, which are absolutely unique to the Mini and a throwback to the original Mini. Now, this Mini isn't as Mini anymore, but if you look in the back, there's still hardly no leg room whatsoever and the boot. Well, it's more like a glove box. The interior of the X5 diesel is entirely what you would expect. Some say predictable, even boring, but not me. It oozes BMW from every single switch. Whether it's any good or not depends on whether you like BMW interiors, but I can't see any discernible difference between this and any other luxury top-end BMW. One thing I do like though is this fancy sports steering wheel, which is an optional extra, along with the sat-nav system, well, you're talking about four or five grand's worth of extras, the price of another small car. But don't expect any avant-garde styling from the boys and girls in Munich. They wouldn't understand it. Let me just state for the record that this is my car of 2001. I think it's a phenomenal machine. And I say that because what I'm about to say might seem a little bit negative. The interior of the Evo 6 is dreadful. It's unbelievable that a car that goes this well can look like this inside. Looking around, I mean, why have suede and leather and chrome when you can opt for a symphony in grey plastic and black plastic? It is terminally boring. There's not an ounce of chrome, not a single detail to give away what kind of performance it offers. Well, there are a couple of clues. The steering wheel, flat, unadorned, gripping in just the right place. The seats hold you absolutely in place, which you're going to need, because this is a performance car. And maybe that's the clue. Maybe that's what it's about. This is a functional working environment. To criticise it for not having a pretty cabin would be a bit like a fighter pilot criticising his plane cockpit for having no cup holders. Inappropriate. My attention is going to be diverted out there. 
So guys, there must have been other special cars that you drove this year. What yeah. stood out for you, Brendan? I did like the new Lotus Elise, improvement on perfection if possible, but one very special car for me, the new 911 Turbo. Performance, handling, awesome. beauty, it's a classic Gorgeous. and practical. Looks yes. nice. Very practical car. Very, very practical for a family <laughs> man, nice. yes. No, I loved it. Uh, what about you, Richard? Uh, well, I don't like birds, but I did have a drive of a Ferrari 456. <coughs> Um, it's, not, it's the four-seater Ferrari, and it's not one I've ever been particularly bothered by, but it's 160 grand, but it's just the classiest package. It's an incredible Can't experience you? to drive. Yes, so <laughs> reasonably priced. If, and practical, four-seater. I'll seat. have two. But if it wasn't going to be that, and it's still with your practical thing, the Mercedes E55 AMG. Yeah, I like I that. I wasn't sure oh, wasn't about it fun. on test. You weren't, but actually it grew on me, and it's grown on me since. I, that's a big, fast, practical car. It's very car. big yeah. and very spacious. as well. Mm. Well, as far as I was concerned, I love the Lexus IS200, and this... This year, the IS300 was launched, which got that bit more power, yeah, which it needed. I especially like the sports cross, because that's the sort of lifestyle estate, kind of estate. estate. Yeah. Sexy and practical. I, I think, why bother with that sports cross? No, so. I liked it. I thought it looked nice. And I love the little Seattle Rossa went on the launch earlier on this year. It's tiny, it looks yeah. cool, it's snippy. And nippy. you guys think I'm being girly now. <laughs> Nippy's not good. Nippy doesn't sell. Oh, yeah. For me, nice. Civic Type R, not nippy, it's yeah. just fast. It sounds car. fantastic and it looks, it looks good. What else do you like? Volvo S80. The executive, big surprise, did the dual test with the Jag. It's not very you, is it? No, it's but not it was really. it's the I least you got on it. It looks gorgeous. The, it drove superb. It was fast. Very, very impressed He's with it. It's getting sensible. Yeah. Yeah. I liked it. Lovely car. But of course, Tuscan S as well, as you said before. Yeah, that's it's mental. Like it. uh, Power, the looks, all the, the the chrome and the brass inside. It's an aggressive thing. It's it's a car. Nice. Uh, yeah, I agree. It didn't last very long. <laughs> made, in Black, it? made in Blackpool by a man called Trevor. Very oh. Not very practical. Well, that is it for part one of our review of 2001. Join us after the break where we're going to be driving our beasties. See you then. <laughs> Welcome back to our Christmas Motor Week special. We've all chosen our cars of the year and it's time to take them on the road. Now we're getting down to the nitty gritty of why this is my car of the year. As we all know, most 4x4s wouldn't know what off-roading was if it came up and slapped it in the face with a muddy 1 in 6 gradient. So the secret to a good off-roader is one that looks like it can handle the rough and tumble but still drive quite like a car. And nothing's come close to this until this vehicle, the BMW X5. You see, car enthusiasts can be roughly divided into two categories, those that ride and those that drive. Even if you're behind the wheel of a big Jagger and M-Class Mercedes comes out, one of the X5's main competitors, you still get the feeling that you're a passenger, that you're not engaged, that you're riding. Whereas the X5, with its elevated driving position, really makes you feel like you're behind the wheel of a sporty hatchback or at the very least a very quick estate car. Alright, it's stretching the point a bit but you get the picture. Time now for all you technical bods to pay attention, well both of you. We've got a 3 litre diesel engine producing 184 brake horsepower. That will get the mighty German to 60 in just over 10 seconds, very respectable for a diesel and for something of this size. Top speed on this X5 is only 4 miles per hour slower than the 4.4 petrol engine at 124. But where this engine comes into its own is fuel economy of course. 29.1 miles per gallon on the combined cycle compared to 20 on the petrol version. But make no mistake, ignore the fact that it's a diesel. In fact, if anything, it's a better engine. This car is a driver's car with its unitary body and independent sports suspension. It drives and feels two million times better than anything in its class. It really is that good. Now, I thought that this car would be all about looks and no action, but oh, how wrong I was. Now, the Mini 1 hasn't lost any of the fun of the drive of the original Mini. It's so different in here. The windscreen's really small, the steering wheel's really big, and you really bounce along. It's full of character, great fun. But the secret behind the handling of this car is that the four wheels are absolutely in the four corners of the car, and this gives it an advantage in handling. One of my other favourite features is the gearbox. It's such a notchy, tight, short throw. And if you compare it to the spongy, nondescript Peugeot 206, you really begin to realise that this is a very special car. Now, I ain't going to break the land speed record in my Mini, and I really, 
wish, I wish it had more pull as I drove away from the traffic lights. But my prayers might be answered next year because BMW are introducing the Mini Cooper S. With 168 brake horsepower under the bonnet, it's going to go from 0 to 60 in 7.4 seconds. Yes, bring it on. I can't wait. The Mini 1 has a 1.6 litre BMW engine delivering 90 brake horsepower and the 0 to 60 is slower than you'd think at 10.9 seconds. Top speed, if you take it back to its roots on the Autobahn, should you want to risk it, is 115 miles an hour. Your fuel consumption is a very healthy 43.5 miles to the gallon, so your running costs should also be reasonably mini. Hang on a minute. Is that Rob? <laughs> now, I know I slated the interior of the Clio, but to be honest, it could have pink velvet cushions and a stick on Garfield on the windscreen for all I care. Plus, you don't need a sense of occasion from an interior <laughs> when an engine sounds this good. That V6, it just sings at any revs. Overall, the feel of the V6 Clio is great. The steering is awesome. It's so sharp, so responsive, but more importantly, it feels solid. The likes of the Elise and the VX220 may be better track cars, but for every day larking about on quiet moor roads, this is brilliant. There are a couple of things that can catch you out on the Clio. That turning circle is appalling, so three point turns become 85 point turns. And the other more serious thing to watch out for is that twitchy back end. That 3 litre V6 blasts out 230 brake horsepower and mountains of torque that'll get you to 60 in just 6 seconds. Top whack is just under a very impressive 150 miles an hour. Come on! And fuel consumption? Who cares? Now if I was being picky about the Clio V6, I've got to say it could even do with a little bit more oomph than its 230 brake horsepower. Don't get me wrong, it's still bloody fast and it pulls for England. It just could do with being a little bit more frantic under acceleration. <laughs> I really do need to change that coffee. There are cars around that you can drive at speed, but it's a fluid, comfortable, elegant process. This is not such a car. This is a brutal experience. The controls are so direct. If they gave you any more feedback, frankly, it would hurt. You would have bruises. With every extremity of my body, I'm feeling what the car's doing. My backside on the seat is telling me what the suspension is doing. Compressing and rebounding and keeping all four wheels in contact with the road. The steering, I can feel it chattering everything back to me. The brakes, marvellous. There's enough servo in there to help me stop. But I'm in control. I'm doing the braking, not the car. Now, I'm saying all of this despite the fact that this car is deceptively clever because I've already said the interior is dreadful. I've only just realised there isn't even a radio in here. It couldn't be any more basic. But in terms of technology, there's actually, this is the very clever bit, all sorts of gubbins going on under the surface. Truth is, I'm not this good a driver. The car's very, very good. It's better than me. It's flattering. That two-litre mild-mannered engine Yes, screams out 280 brake horsepower. Thank heaven for turbos. Your 0 to 60 time is a rather tasty four and a half seconds, and it tops out at 150 miles an hour. You can't handle it. So, four completely different cars, but each one of them appealing to each one of us in its own special way. But what about the other end of the scale? The okay, uh, the cars from 2001, the, the ones we didn't like, yeah. the moose, the howlers. What do you reckon? Well, I went on the Citroen C5 launch earlier on this year, and I don't think I can think of a more awful, ugly car on the road. It's massive and it's just... It's a big boat, isn't it? It it's is. It's, and to drive, it's just so dull and bland. And then recently, I got into a Sia Ibiza TDI, and I thought that I'd got into a light goods van. It was so raucous and, oh, it was unrefined. You get what you pay for. Unless, of course, you buy a Mercedes E55 AMG. Over 50 <laughs> you really grand. Don't like that I don't. Car. Over 50 grand. I want an interior. It's too tonic. It's no. spark. It's, a, it's, it's a V8 square German. It's got no bits That's stuck it. On it. That's There's no, no passion about it. 
I'm going to be cruel here, and I feel dreadful doing this, but my howler of 2001 is the Kia Rio. Oh. Don't know it, it's a very cheap, rugged, practical little estate car. That's all it's supposed to be, and that's all it is. And I just can't like it. Bless them, they're trying, but it's, it's horrible. Oh. Well, I've had quite a good year, actually, doing dream deals. I've been driving a lot of my dream motors. Did you get here? Mr. Positive. But one stinker that was lousy was the Fiat Punto R bath uh, that Glenda reviewed. Yeah. Uh, I had a go in that, not good. Yeah. But apart from that, I don't think you get any stinkers these days. Mm -hmm. Mr. Positive. Well, let's keep the positive thing going and just give ourselves a reminder of just what it was about our four cars of 2001 that we really liked. So, to sum up the Clio V6, well, it is the most ridiculous looking car on the road. It's completely impractical and it costs twice the price of a regular Clio. But because it is just so insane, that's what makes it my car of the year for 2001. Starting at £10,500, you show me another car in its class that can offer such amazing value for money. Looks, agility, fantastic handling, fun, all in one little mini. I think you can call this car an icon. Do you know, I'm tired of trying to defend this car on the grounds of its looks. I admit it, it is plug ugly inside and out, but I don't care. It loves driving and I love driving and we're very happy together. At last, there's a four x four with more than enough off-road capability, but that looks, feels, and drives like a car with its superb chassis, and now with an even more refined diesel engine. You too can be in charge, but for today, I'm the daddy. Well, we look forward to testing and driving all of the new cars in 2002, but until then, have a great Christmas. Don't drink and drive. Eat far too much. And come and see me in Pinto. Oh, oh no, no, we won't. won't. Charming. Merry Christmas. See you next year.